The Introduction to the Old Testament, Unit 24, Jeremiah and Lamentations. Now, the only reason that we are putting Lamentations in here is that some believe that Jeremiah wrote the book of Lamentations. But as we will see, that is a misinterpretation of a passage in Second Chronicles. In the book of Jeremiah, we have a work that is in the 7th century, the death of Ashurbanipal, the great Assyrian leader, was in 627 BC. The ministry of Jeremiah began in 627. The purge of Josiah, where he is trying to remove foreign elements from the religion, begins in 628, so that the beginning of the ministry of Jeremiah and the reform of Josiah begins almost at the same time. The death of Josiah in 610 at the hands of the Egyptians put an end to the reform. Now let's take a look at the book of Jeremiah. It is the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, one of the priests of Anathoth. So he is definitely designated as a priest. The word of the Lord came to him in the thirteenth year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah. We are told that it was in the eighteenth year of Josiah that his reform began. Jeremiah continued prophesying until the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, when the people of Jerusalem went into exile. So Jeremiah has a very long period of prophesying, over 40 years. Now Jeremiah tells about the call that he had received, and that is in chapter 1 and verse 4. It says, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. So he is told that before he was born, this was designated by God. He claims that he is too young to be a prophet. And God tells him in verse 7, Do not say, I am only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to, and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. Now that, those six verbs are used several times in the book of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah has a very interesting ministry. Not only is he commanded by God to deliver a message to the people, he also is confronted by opposition, not only from the people generally, but others who call themselves prophets. In fact, there are more false prophets than there are true prophets. And Jeremiah even questions this. Is he doing the right thing when there are so many that are opposed to him? 
In that first chapter where he has his call, he also has a vision. The word of the Lord came to me, verse 11, What do you see, Jeremiah? I see the branch of an almond tree, I replied. The Lord said to me, You have seen correctly, for I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. This is another of the play on words where the word for almond tree and the word for watching sound almost the same. And then he has a second vision. I see a boiling pot tilting away from the north. In verse 14, the Lord said to me, From the north, disaster will be poured out on all who live in the land. I am about to summon all the people of the northern kingdoms, declares the Lord. Now this will be the Babylonians mainly with whom Jeremiah is concerned. And he says that their kings will come and set up their thrones in the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem. They will come against all her surrounding walls and against all the towns of Judah. I will pronounce my judgments on my people because of their wickedness in forsaking me, the burning incense to other gods, and in worshiping what their hands have made. So idolatry is going to be one of the main sins that Jeremiah will be preaching against. The warnings begin in chapter 2 and go through chapter 35. So there are many, many different warnings that Jeremiah gives to the people of Judah. In chapter 2, verse 1, it says that the word of the Lord came to me, Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem, I remember the devotion of your youth, how as a bride you loved me and followed me through the desert, through a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. All who devoured her were held guilty, and disaster overtook them. Now this is the condition where Israel was devoted to the Lord and God saw to it that their enemies were destroyed. Then in verse 5, this is what the Lord says, What fault did your fathers find in me that they strayed so far from me? They followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. They did not ask, Where is the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt and led us through the barren wilderness, through a land of deserts and rifts, a land of drought and darkness, a land where no one travels and no one lives? I brought you into a fertile land, to eat its fruit and rich produce. But you came and defiled my land and made my inheritance detestable. The priests did not ask, Where is the Lord? Those who deal with the law did not know me. The leaders rebelled against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal, following the worthless idols. Therefore, I bring charges against you again, declares the Lord, and I will bring charges against your children's children. And then he tells them to go over to the coast of Katim and send a Kedar and observe and ask, has there been anything like this before? Has a nation ever changed its gods? Yet they are not gods at all. Of course, he's going to argue this throughout his prophecy, that idols made by hands are worthless. But my people have exchanged their glory 
for worthless idols. Be appalled at this, O heavens, and shudder with great horror, declares the Lord. So that again, this charge of idolatry, where they have substituted idols for the living God. In verse 13, it says, My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. So that they have left the living water and have substituted for it a cistern, and the cistern is broken. So this is the way that Jeremiah describes how they have gone from serving Yahweh to serving idols. Now we could go through many of these sins of the people, since there are many of them. For instance, in verse 20, Long ago you broke off your yoke and tore off your bonds, and you said, I will not serve you. Indeed, on every high hill and under every spreading tree you lay down as a prostitute. I had planted you like a choice vine of sound and reliable stock. How then did you turn against me into a corrupt wild vine? So that is another way of speaking of the idolatry of the people. In chapter 7, there is a temple sermon that is preached by Jeremiah. And this, of course, gets him into trouble. It says, This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand at the gate of the Lord's house and there proclaim this message. Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah who come through these gates to worship the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Reform your ways and your actions, and I will let you live in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words and say, This is the temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. The temple of the Lord. If you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the alien, the fatherless, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then I will let you live in this place, in the land I gave your forefathers forever and ever. But look, you are trusting in deceptive words that are worthless. In fact, what they are saying is the temple of the Lord is here in Jerusalem. And if the temple of the Lord is here, the Lord is here. And if the Lord is here, then we don't have to worry. But they have forsaken the Lord. And that is their problem. In verse 12, they are to go to Shiloh and see what is there. That is where a shrine had been, and it was destroyed. And he can do the same thing for the temple in Jerusalem. In verse 8 of chapter 8, How can you say, We are wise, for we have the law of the Lord? Well, certainly they have the law of the Lord, but they weren't following it when actually the lying pen of the scribes has handled it falsely. So again, they are condemned for leaving what God had given them and following after foreign idols. Now the sermon in chapter 7 goes on through chapter 10. It's a long sermon. And because of this, Jeremiah is not permitted to go into the temple again. The people are against it. And then in chapter 13, 
Jeremiah is told to make a illustrated sermon. In verse 1, go and buy a linen belt and put it around your waist, but do not let it touch water. So I bought a belt as the Lord directed and put it around my waist. Then the word of the Lord came to me a second time. Take the belt you bought and are wearing around your waist and go now to Parah and hide it there in a crevice of the rocks. Now, Parath is the same as the Euphrates, but he probably didn't go clear to the Euphrates River, but somewhere near the Jordan River. He hid the belt there, and then in verse 6 it says, Many days later the Lord said to me, Go now to Parath and get the belt I told you to hide there. So I went to Parath and dug up the belt and took it from the place where I had hidden it, but now it was ruined and completely useless. Now there is a lesson to be learned from this. In verse 8, Then the word of the Lord came to me. This is what the Lord says, In the same way I will ruin the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. So the belt represents the pride of the city of Jerusalem and it's going to be ruined in the same way as this belt that Jeremiah hid. In verse 11 it says, For as a belt is bound around a man's waist, so I bound the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah to me, declares the Lord to be my people for my renown and praise and honor, but they have not listened. And that's going to be the message of Jeremiah constantly. They haven't listened and they will not listen now. In chapter 18 is another lesson, and this is the lesson of the potter. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter turned it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. I went on a field trip to Hebron with the Institute of Holy Land Studies, or now Jerusalem University College, and the potter was working at his wheel, and he was making a beautiful little vessel. And our leader was reading from the passage here in Jeremiah 18, and when she said it was ruined in his hands, he took his hand, his fist, and smashed it. And everybody gasped because it was such a cute little vessel that he was making. And then he took the same clay and molded it into another vessel. And God has a message for the people here in the same way. He says, He is the potter and we are are the clay. In verse 5, the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter does, declares the Lord? Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. If at any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation, I warn, repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. But there's also the opposite in verse 9. If at another time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good I had intended 
to do for it. And so Jeremiah again uses the terms that came at his calling to say that God is able to raise up the country or to destroy the country. And it depends on their response to the word. And then in chapter 19, Jeremiah is told to buy a clay jar from a potter, take along some of the elders of the people and of the priests, and go out to the valley of Ben-Hinnom. Uh, Ben-Hinnom is to the south of the temple. This is where the garbage was generally thrown. And he talks to the people there, and he says that the people have forsaken me and made this place for foreign gods. They have burned sacrifices in it to gods that made this a place of foreign gods. In verse 10, break the jar while those who go with you are watching. And say, this is what the Lord Almighty says, I will smash this nation and this city just as this potter's jar is smashed and can be repaired. Then they will bury the dead in Tophet until there is no more room. This is what I will do to this place and to those who live here, declares the Lord. I will make this city like Tophet. The houses in Jerusalem and those of the kings of Judah will be defiled like this place, Tophet. All the houses where they burn incense on the roofs to all the starry hosts and poured out drink offerings to other gods. So again, he calls their attention to the fact that they are idolaters. They are serving other gods. Then in chapter 20, Jeremiah comes into contact with Pashur, who is the chief officer of the temple. He doesn't like what Jeremiah is prophesying. So in verse 2, it says that he had Jeremiah the prophet beaten and put in the stocks at the upper gate of Benjamin at the Lord's temple. So he's left overnight in those stocks. And then in verse 3, the next day when Pashur released him from the stocks, Jeremiah said to him, The Lord's name for you is not Pashur, but Magor Misabib. For this is what the Lord says, I will make you a terror to yourself and to all your friends. So this means a terror on every side. That is what he is going to be called after this. And he says in verse 6, You, Pashur, and all who live in your house will go into exile to Babylon. There you will die and be buried, you and all your friends to whom you have prophesied lies. In chapter 24, Jeremiah has another vision, and this vision has to do with baskets of figs. After Jehoiakim, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and the officials, the craftsmen, and the artisans of Judah were carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the Lord showed me two baskets of figs placed in front of the temple of the Lord. Now this exile took place in 597. And those who were still in Jerusalem felt that this was a sign that the evil people had been taken into exile and the good people remained in Jerusalem. But that's not the way that it is interpreted here. In verse 2 of chapter 24, it says, One basket had very good figs, like those that ripen early. The other basket had very poor figs, so bad they could not be eaten. 
And then the question comes from the Lord to Jeremiah. What do you see, Jeremiah? Figs, I answered. The good ones are very good. The poor ones are so bad they cannot be eaten. And then the explanation from the Lord. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Like these good figs, I regard as good the exiles from Judah whom I sent away from this place to the land of the Babylonians. My eyes will watch over them for their good. And I will bring them back to this land. I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not uproot them. Again, referring to that same phrase that was given to Jeremiah at the beginning to uproot and tear down and to destroy and then to build up. So they are going to be built up. But then in verse 8, but like the poor figs, which are so bad they cannot be eaten, says the Lord, so will I deal with Zedekiah, king of Judah, his officials and the survivors from Jerusalem, whether they remain in this land or live in Egypt. I will make them abhorrent and an offense to all the kingdoms of the earth, a reproach and a byword an object of ridicule and cursing. Wherever I banish them, I will send the sword, famine, and plague against them until they are destroyed from the land I gave to them and their fathers. And then in chapter 25, there is this famous prophecy of 70 years of exile. Part of the people have gone into exile in 597. The rest of the people will go into exile in 586. But it says, The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, which was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. So Jeremiah the prophet said to all the people of Judah and to all those living in Jerusalem, for 23 years, from the 13th year of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, until this very day, the word of the Lord has come to me, and I have spoken to you again and again, but you have not listened. But then in verse 7, but you did not listen to me, declares the Lord, and you have provoked me with what your hands have made, and you have brought harm to yourselves. And then he goes on to speak about their going to go into exile. Verse 11, this whole country will become a desolate wasteland, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. In verse 12, But when the 70 years are fulfilled, I will punish the king of Babylon and his nation, the land of the Babylonians. This is signaling that the exile will last for 70 years. Now, when we deal with Daniel, we'll see that he has a different interpretation of this where it becomes 70 weeks of years. But here is 70 years, and it's approximately 70 years before the exiles are allowed to come back to Judah. In chapter 23, there is the righteous branch that is mentioned. He begins by saying, Woe to the shepherds! who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Now the shepherds are the rulers, and they are not doing what they should be doing. Shepherds are supposed to take care of the sheep. But it says, you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care on them. In verse 5 it says, the days are coming, declares the Lord, 
when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord our righteousness. Now there doesn't seem to be anyone in the Old Testament that has that name, and so we assume that this is talking about Jesus when he comes in the New Testament. In verse 9, he has a message for the prophets. Now these are lying prophets. He says, My heart is broken within me. All my bones tremble. I am like a drunken man, like a man overcome by wine, because of the Lord and his holy words. The land is full of adulterers. Because of the curse, the land lies parched, and the pastures in the desert are withered. The prophets follow an evil course and use their power unjustly. And then in verse 11, he condemns both the prophet and the priest and says they are godless. Even in my temple, I find their wickedness. This should not be. The temple is where God dwells and there is supposed to be righteousness there. Then he is going to bring disaster on them. In verse 13, he elaborates, Among the prophets of Samaria, I saw this repulsive thing. They prophesied by Baal and led my people Israel astray. And among the prophets of Jerusalem, I have seen something horrible. They commit adultery and live a lie. They strengthen the hands of evildoers so that no one turns from his wickedness. They are all like Sodom to me. The people of Jerusalem are like Gomorrah. And because of this, he says they're going to make them eat bitter food and drink poisoned water because from the prophets of Jerusalem, ungodliness has spread throughout the land. These prophets, and there are numerous, they are prophesying peace for the people. Everything is going to be nice. They're going to live in luxury. And of course, this is not the message that Jeremiah is preaching. And so he is bothered by these false prophets because they are so numerous. In chapter 28, he comes into contact with a false prophet, Hananiah. In the fifth month of that same year, the fourth year early in the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, the prophet Hananiah, son of Azur, who was from Gibeon, said to me in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests and all the people, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says, I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two years, I will bring back to this place all the articles of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, removed from here and took to Babylon. I will also bring back to this place Jehoiakim, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and all the other exiles from Judah who went to Babylon, declares the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. So this is the message that the false prophet Hananiah is giving to the people. And Jeremiah is there with him. And so Jeremiah says, Amen, may it be done as you have said. But then he corrects the message of Hananiah. Verse 8, from early times the prophets who preceded you and me have prophesied war, disaster, 
and plague against many countries and great kingdoms, but the prophet who prophesies peace will be recognized as one truly sent by the Lord only if his prediction comes true. And then it says in verse 10 that the prophet Hananiah took the yoke off the neck of the prophet Jeremiah and broke it. Now Jeremiah does not have any reply to this at the time, but the Lord later speaks to him and tells him he broke the yoke of wood, but I'm going to make a yoke of iron. And then in verse 15, the prophet Jeremiah said to Hananiah the prophet, Listen, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you, yet you have persuaded this nation to trust in lies. Now this is what Jeremiah faced all the time that you had these prophets who were telling the people what they wanted to hear. Therefore, this is what the Lord says, I am about to remove you from the face of the earth. This very year, you are going to die because you have preached rebellion against the Lord. And then we are told in the seventh month of that same year, Hananiah the prophet died. Now it began in the fourth month, so this means in three months, Hananiah is gone. And then Jeremiah wrote a letter to the exiles. He not only is bothered with false prophets in Judah, he's bothered with false prophets in Babylon, those that have gone into exile. And the gist of this letter is that the people are to settle in the land, they build houses for themselves, marry, take wives for their sons and husbands for their daughters, and they are to plant gardens, they are to do what is good, they are to go on living just as if they were in the land of Judah. In verse 10, this is what the Lord says, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And he's going to bring them back from captivity. But he has opposition in Babylon. Verse 24, tell Shemaiah, the Nehalamite. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. You sent letters in your own name to all the people of Jerusalem, to Zephaniah, son of Maasiah, the priest, and to all the other priests. You said to Zephaniah, The Lord has appointed you priest in place of Jehoiada to be in charge of the house of the Lord. You should put any madman who acts like a prophet into the stocks and neck irons. So why have you not reprimanded Jeremiah from Anathoth? So this is one of the prophets from Babylon writing to the high priest in Jerusalem saying you ought to put Jeremiah in stocks. But then it says in verse 27, Zephaniah the priest, however, read the letter to Jeremiah the prophet. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, Send this message to all the exiles. This is what the Lord says about Shemaiah the Nehalamite. Because Shemaiah has prophesied to you, even though I did not send him, and has led you to believe a lie, this is what the Lord says, 
I will surely punish Shemaiah, the Neholamite, and his descendants. He will have no one left among this people, nor will he see the good things I will do for my people, declares the Lord, because he has preached rebellion against me. In chapter 32, Jeremiah is imprisoned, but he is told by the Lord that he has a cousin who wants to sell a field, and he is to buy that field. In verse 6 of chapter 32, Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me, Hanamel, son of Shalom, your uncle, is going to come to you and say, Buy my field at Anathoth, because as nearest relative, it is your right and duty to buy it. And this was the procedure that they had set up where if you are in debt or need money, you can have a redeemer buy your field and keep it in the proper channels. And so this is what Jeremiah did in verse 13. In their presence I gave Baruch these instructions this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Take these documents, and those documents are mentioned in verse 10. Both the sealed and the unsealed copies of the deed of purchase, and put them in a clay jar, so they will last a long time. For this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Houses, fields, and vineyards will again be bought in this land. Now this is one of the few times when a transaction is mentioned. And you notice that there is a sealed copy and an unsealed copy. The sealed copy is kept that way in case there is some claim made against the property. The unsealed document is looked at first, and if there is any question, then the sealed document goes to the judge who's making the decision. Now, there are some complaints in the book, and these are the complaints of Jeremiah. And as you have seen already, there are many reasons why Jeremiah would complain. In chapter 12, and the first four verses, Jeremiah says, You are always righteous, O Lord, when I bring a case before you. Yet I would speak with you about your justice. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all the faithless live at ease? You have planted them, and they have taken root. They grow and bear fruit. You are always on their lips, but far from their hearts. Yet you know me, O Lord. You see me and test my thoughts about you. Drag them off like sheep to be butchered. Set them apart for the day of slaughter. Now this is like ourselves. When we look around us and we see so much evil, being done. And we question God, why haven't you taken care of that? You're supposed to punish evil. And so that's what Jeremiah is doing here. And then in chapter 20, beginning with verse 7, Lord, you deceived me, and I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. I am ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. Whenever I speak, I cry out, proclaiming violence and destruction. So the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. But if I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. I hear many whispering terror on every side. 
Now this is the same phrase that is used of Pashur, the priest who put Jeremiah in stocks. There's terror on every side. Report him. Let's report him. All my friends are waiting for me to slip, saying, perhaps he will be deceived. Then we will prevail over him and take our revenge on him. And then again in chapter 20, verse 14, Jeremiah curses the day that he was born. Cursed be the day I was born. May the day my mother bore me not be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought my father the news, who made him very glad, saying, A child is born to you, a son. May that man be like the towns the Lord overthrew without pity. May he hear wailing in the morning, a battle cry at noon. For he did not kill me in the womb with my mother as my grave. Her womb enlarged forever. Why did I ever come out of the womb to see trouble and sorrow and to end my days in shame? Now on this occasion God doesn't answer him. In chapter 36, Jeremiah is told to take a scroll and write down everything that God has spoken through him. And so this is what he does. It says it's in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah. This word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Take a scroll and write on it all the words I have spoken to you concerning Israel, Judah, and all the other nations from the time I began speaking to you in the reign of Josiah till now. So from that 627 on, and this is probably in about 605, he is to write down everything that God has spoken to him. And so he called Baruch, verse 4, the son of Neriah, and while Jeremiah dictated all the words the Lord had spoken to him, Baruch wrote them on the scroll. Now Jeremiah can't go to the temple, so he sends Baruch with this, and has him read it to the people. In verse 11, it says, When Micaiah, son of Gamariah, the son of Shaphan, heard all the words of the Lord from the scroll, he went down to the secretary's room in the royal palace where all the officials were sitting. And Elishama, the secretary, Deliah, son of Shemaiah, Elnathan, son of Achbor, Gamariah, son of Shaphan, Zedekiah, son of Hananiah, and all the other officials. So Baruch read the message in their hearing, and then they thought that it should be read to the king. But they took precaution here. In verse 19, the official said to Baruch, You and Jeremiah go and hide. Don't let anyone know where you are. And so the scroll was read to the king, and after every three or four columns were read, he would take his knife and cut it off and throw it into the brazier that was burning there in the room. And it says in verse 27, after the king burned the scroll, containing the words that Baruch had written at Jeremiah's dictation, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, take another scroll and write on it all the words that were on the first scroll, which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, burned up. And then there were some additional words written for Jehoiakim. And so the scroll was replaced. In chapter 37, Jeremiah is put in prison. In verse 4, it says that Jeremiah was free to come and go among the people, for he had not yet been put in prison. Pharaoh's army had marched out of Egypt, 
And when the Babylonians who were besieging Jerusalem heard the report about them, they withdrew from Jerusalem. So Jeremiah was going to take this opportunity to go home to Anathoth, but he was arrested by the guard on duty. And in verse 16, Jeremiah was put into a vaulted cell in a dungeon where he remained a long time. And then the king had an audience with Jeremiah after this, but it really didn't help Jeremiah because Zedekiah the king was afraid of some of the nobles and he wouldn't do what was right. If he had surrendered to the king of Babylon, the city of Jerusalem would have been spared. But since he refused to do this, the city was destroyed and the temple was destroyed and most of the people then were taken into exile. Then in chapter 38, in verse 6, they took Jeremiah and put him into the cistern of Malchijah, the king's son, who was in the courtyard of the guard. They lowered Jeremiah by ropes into the cistern. It had no water in it, only mud. And Jeremiah sank down into the mud. But then Ebed melech a Cushite, an official of Zedekiah, went to the king and got permission to remove Jeremiah from the cistern. And it tells how he did this by getting some rags that Jeremiah could put under his arms so it wouldn't injure him. And then they pulled Jeremiah up by ropes out of the cistern. Later, Ebed melech is going to receive a message from Jeremiah because of his action of helping Jeremiah. God is going to be with him and will keep him alive during all of the problems that Judah faced. Beginning with chapter 39 is the fall of Jerusalem. As Gedaliah is appointed as governor over the country and he is assassinated by Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah. And then the rest of the people ask Jeremiah what they should do. And he said, it's God's will that you remain in Judah. But they wouldn't listen to him. And so all of them were taken to Egypt. And while in Egypt, another message comes from Jeremiah that at this place where they had stopped, Nebuchadnezzar is going to set up his throne and he will destroy the temples of Egypt. And so this happened later. In chapter 45 is a message to Baruch. Now he's the scribe that wrote all of this material for Jeremiah. And this is probably the shortest chapter in the book of Jeremiah. This is what Jeremiah the prophet told Baruch, son of Neriah, in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, after Baruch had written on a scroll the words Jeremiah was then dictating. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says of you, Baruch. You said, Woe to me! The Lord has added sorrow to my pain. I am worn out with groaning and find no rest. But the message is that wherever you go, I will let you escape with your life. In chapters 46 through 51 are messages of judgment on the nations. And then in chapter 52 is the historical appendix that is added to the book uh, to indicate that the words of Jeremiah were fulfilled actually in history. And in chapter 31, this is talking about the new covenant that God will make with his people. 
in chapter 31, verse 23, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. When I bring them back from captivity, the people in the land of Judah and in its towns will once again use these words, The Lord bless you, O righteous dwelling, O sacred mountain. People will live together in Judah and all its towns. Families and those who move about with their flocks, I will refresh the weary and satisfy the faint. And then it speaks about a saying that they were using in the land. In verse 29, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. And it's not going to be used again, because instead, everyone will die for his own sin. Whoever eats sour grapes, his own teeth will be set on edge. Now, Ezekiel is also going to develop that same concept. And in verse 31, the time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. And then this is what the covenant is in verse 33. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Now this is also going to be repeated in the book of Ezekiel, but Jeremiah is saying it's a new covenant. And it's going to be written on the heart. Now, it is not fulfilled in the Old Testament. This is something that does not come to pass until after the death of Jesus Christ and the giving of the Holy Spirit. Then the covenant is written on the heart and they are able to keep it. Now, let's turn to the book of Lamentations. And again, I say the only reason that we discuss it here is because there are those who believe that Jeremiah wrote the book of Lamentations. In 2 Chronicles 35, 25, it mentions Jeremiah composed laments for Josiah. Now, the book of Lamentations has nothing to do with the death of Josiah. The book of Lamentations has to do with the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. For the book of Lamentations, we have God punishes sin and God's judgment is just. They deserved it. God instructs the faithful through suffering, and God is faithful, instilling hope in the righteous. Now, the book of Lamentations commemorates the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonian armies of Nebuchadnezzar. The poems are both a testimony to divine justice and a call for repentance for the people of God. The major themes in the book of Lamentations is human suffering and divine abandonment. God's presence in the book of Lamentations is expressed in a negative way through the motif of divine abandonment. The poet relates that God has spurned, 
rejected and abandoned Judah, king, priest, and sanctuary. Previously, the prophet Ezekiel witnessed the departure of God's glory from the Jerusalem temple due to their covenant violations, including blatant idolatry. In Lamentations, the first lamentation is for Jerusalem's misery and desertion. The second is a lamentation for the daughter of Zion, cut down in Yahweh's wrath. The third is the poet's grief and hope. And the fourth is the horror of the siege. And the fifth is Zion's disgrace remembered, a petition for restoration. The Book of Lamentations is the third book in the Megalot. Now the Megalot is made up of five books. It's the Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, and Esther. These are read at the ceremonies in Israel. The Book of Lamentations is assigned to be read annually on the ninth day of Av, the day of mourning for the destruction of Jerusalem. Now that represents not the destruction that is in 586 only, but also the destruction of the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD. They believe that the destruction of the temple happened on the same day. Now in the book of Lamentations, there are three poems that are funeral dirges. That is one, two, and four. The third one is an individual lamentation, and the fifth is a community lamentation. Four of them are alphabetic acrostic. There is a section in your textbook that I would like to read to you at this time. Uh, this is the work of R.B.Y. Scott in his wisdom literature. It says that there are eight different reasons for the problem of human suffering. And he says the first is retributive, just punishment for sin. Second is disciplinary, corrective affliction. Three is probationary, God's testing of the heart. And you find that in Job 1.6. The fourth is temporary or apparent in comparison with the good or bad fortune of others. Job 5.18 is an example of that. Five is inevitable as a result of the fall. Number six is necessarily mysterious. Since God's character and plan are inscrutable and we can't really know what he is about. And number seven, haphazard and morally meaningless, in that time and chance happens to all. And number eight is vicarious. One may suffer for another or for the many. You can see that in Isaiah 53, 3. Now that is the work of R.B.Y. Scott. So often we ask the question, why do people suffer? And he has come to this conclusion after he has studied all of the wisdom material.